In this video, I wanted to talk a bit about where Kant got his table of the form of judgments. So if you remember from the metaphysical deduction, the, the form, form of uh, judgments, I'm just going to use a J there, was where he got his, his table, his table of categories or concepts for the understanding categories so under I'll just write understand for under for understanding and so I didn't really go into in the last couple videos about where Kant even came up with this table of judgments and so that is what I'm going to do today and so Kant got his table of judgments and I have three of the or three of the sort of categories I don't want to use categories because that's used in the understanding, but three of the types of judgment, I guess we could say here. Uh, and I will go into his, uh, his modal forms of judgments in a little bit because those are handled somewhat differently. But where Kant got those is right from the Aristotelian type of logic that people were steeped in in his time. Well, I mean, people were steeped in it from the time of Aristotle all the way up until about the 19th century when uh, when things like quantificational logic and modal logic and things like that uh, sort of, I don't want to say replaced it, but sort of improved upon the Aristotelian form of logic. And so I have here the table of opposition. Uh, so table of opposition is what it's usually called uh, so opposition but anyway so these are the forms of propositions uh, these are the forms that propositions can take and so we see here we have all SRP and so if this left circle in the Venn diagram is S, uh, and then we have this part here blacked out so that only the S that are overlapping with P uh, exist, and therefore all S are P. Uh, where down here we now have some S are P, where uh, the entire circle of S is now in play here, um, and only some of them overlap with P. Uh, and then, of course, we can have no S as P, where the part where it overlaps is blacked out. Uh, and you could think of that in the same as if we had two sort of non-overlapping circles. They, this diagram just wanted to use sort of the same Venn diagram for all of these. Uh, and so we see that none of the S overlaps with any of the P, and so no S is P. Uh, and then we have some S are not P. Uh, and we can see that up here they call this contrary because uh, if some or if all S are P, then it's impossible for there to be no S that are P and vice versa. If no S are P, then it is impossible for all S to be P. Whereas these are uh, subcontrary, which uh, essentially means we are looking at the same thing but we're just focusing on different parts of it so you can see they have the the redded out part here and the redded out part here uh, and so if some s are p then we also know that some s are not p because uh, if some if some of the s are p then there is still this part here where that is not p and so that is what is being focused on over here uh, and so uh, that is, um, so that is sort of how you can look at the table of opposition. And so in C Kant's uh, forms of judgment, uh, he is looking at quantity. So the first part is quantity, which is just looking at whether all or some S is P. So it's looking at how much of S is P. Uh, and so that is why it's called quantity. And I have this part down here redded out a little bit because in Aristotelian logic, uh, the singular um, is 
able to be sort of subsumed into the universal because if I say uh, Socrates is a man we're saying that all of Socrates is a man uh, and so we could say we could say that uh, that that all all Greeks are men with all Greeks are men we are saying that that the Venn diagram we have the circle that represent Greeks so I'll put that in G and we could maybe even say that this box here is is men uh, but you know this box could in in logic this box could be exactly the same size as this circle here but uh, we know in fact that uh, not everybody who is a man is also Greek but this here shows that all Greeks are men because uh, no matter where you go outside this circle you are still within the the concept of men uh, but then if we are looking at just Socrates uh, so we have sort of a dot there that is still within men and so all of Socrates is a man and so uh, it's essentially just changing the size of this circle here because we could look at uh, a subset of the Greeks and a smaller subset and a smaller subset and getting smaller and smaller until we get to just Socrates uh, and so that is why the singular can in Aristotelian logic is able to be subsumed in a universal but Kant makes this distinct this distinction here uh, of the singular uh, as being sort of different than the universal uh, and then quality is sort of um, the affirmative which is saying uh, so it can be all or some but it's saying that s is p so s is p uh, so and then there's negative which is saying that no s is p and so we are negating we are saying that none of the s is p uh, and then he distinguishes also so s is not p and so we can see quality here so s is p uh, so this right here this one right here and this one right here uh, would both be in the affirmative where this would be in the negative and then this down here is uh, in the the infinite so he calls it the infinite but it is saying that uh, that of s uh, none of them are p so we cannot uh, so all of the s I guess infinite an infinite number of s is not p and then so Kant uh, then also uh, has this these relations which are essentially the forms that in a syllogism a major premise can take and so the categorical here is uh, sort of your standard Aristotelian syllogism so I have all some no and then I have not here in brackets because it can uh, take on all of those forms which are the forms you see in the table of opposition so uh, so a, a pretty standard form of the Aristotelian syllogism so the categorical version uh, of the the major premise would be something along the lines of all s is p or I guess if we wanted to be grammatically correct all s r p so is is and r are what are called copula and s is or is is just the sort of singular where r is the plural uh, so that is the major premise uh, and then the minor premise would be something like x is s and then the conclusion therefore would be x is p 
uh, and we can look at this in the Venn diagram form as well. So if we have our, our S here, and all of them are P, and we have X within S here, then we know that X is also in P. Uh, and so that is how that sort of, uh, sort of standard Aristotelian syllogism works. Uh, but then the if-then or hypothetical takes the form of something like if A, then B, where this part here is what is known as the antecedent, and this part here is what is known as the, the consequent. And so this is a major premise here. Uh, and there are two different ways we can evaluate this. So we can either affirm the antecedent. So if we say A, if we say that A is the case, uh, then we can conclude, therefore, B is also the case. And this is what is called modus ponens. But we could also uh, deny the consequent. So we could say not B, therefore not A. And this is what is called uh, modus, so it should be an O, modus tollens. And I think for most people, modus ponens is sort of intuitive in the sense that if if A, then B, A, therefore B. So an example might be, if it is raining, then it is wet outside. It's raining, therefore it's wet outside. So, uh, so exchanging A for it's rain, it's raining, and B for it's wet outside. So if it is raining, then it is wet outside. Uh, then we're saying it is raining, therefore it is wet outside. This modus tollens is a little bit less intuitive. Uh, so usually I think what people think is that uh, we could say if A then B, so if A then B, uh, not A, therefore not or not A, therefore not B. But uh, if we look at this in terms of the example I was using, if, if it is raining, then it is wet outside. It's not raining, therefore it's not wet outside. Well, you can't say that for sure because it could be wet outside for some other reason. Maybe you look out your window, you see that the driveway is wet, and you think... Uh, but and you see well it's also sunny it's not raining but it's still wet outside maybe it's because the sprinkler is on and so this right here is not valid but we could say if it is raining out if it is raining outside then it is wet outside well it's not wet outside therefore it's not raining outside uh, and so we can conclude if if the consequent is not true, then we know the antecedent is not true. Um, and so that is uh, modus tollens. And so the other one right here, so the disjunctive can come in several different forms as well, but the major premise is of the form X or Y. Uh, and then we can either uh, we can either confirm X, therefore not Y, or we can uh, say not X, therefore Y. Because this is an exclusive or, so if you are into things like, uh, like uh, computer programming, this would be more like an X or, an exclusive or. So if we... If x, uh, if x or y, then if x is true, then y can't be true because these are exclusive. Or if x is not true, 
then Y must be true because these are uh, exclusive. And so this form is what is called modus tollendo ponens. And we could also have uh, a form that looks more like this, uh, not x and y. And so we can see how this is sort of the same as or, because if we're saying that uh, it is not the case that both x and y, then it is either x or y, because it's not both. Uh, and so this is the same as uh, x or y. Uh, but if it's not x and y, and we say that x is true, then we can then conclude not y. Uh, and so this is a form that is called modus ponendo tollens. Uh, and so these are the uh, forms of a syllogism, and this relation is uh, is specifically looking at the major premise. So this right here in a categorical judgment, this right here in a hypothetical judgment, and then either this or this in a disjunctive uh, judgment here. And so then we can uh, look at at Kant's uh, modal forms, I guess you could say, of judgments. And so he had problematic, which is kind of a weird word usage in my opinion, but maybe it's uh, sort of something that comes from the the uh, going from German, the translation from German to English. Uh, but anyway, there's problematic, assertoric, and apodictic. And so problematic uh, goes with the, the major premise. Assertoric goes with the minor premise, and apodictic goes with the conclusion. And if you remember, uh, maybe a more, a more uh, intuitive way of thinking about these is in the form of the understanding, where this is the form of, of judgments here. Uh, so if we look at it in the form of understanding, I think it's a little bit clearer what each of these things mean. So this is possibility. This is existence. And this is uh, necessity. And so we can look at uh, in a syllogism. So if we say, if we say all S is P, uh, this goes with the the possibility. So possibility. Uh, then we say X is S. This is uh, asserting the existence. Uh, so existence or uh, assertion is the assertoric. Uh, and then we say that X is P is the uh, the necessity. And so it's essentially saying that uh, if these are true, so if true, then, uh, then it is uh, necessary that the conclusion is true. And that goes to how to evaluate uh, things in logic. So in logic, uh, there is validity and sound soundness. So validity is not uh, validity is not looking at whether something is true or not. It is just it is saying that if the premises are true, then the, the conclusion is necessarily true. 
that is validity. Uh, something that is invalid be uh, say that um, that if the the premises are true, then the conclusion is not necessarily true. It, the uh, something that is invalid is that the conclusion does not follow from the premises. Uh, where soundness is actually looking at whether the premises are true or not. So actually going into the real world and actually seeing whether the premises are in fact true. Uh, and so I remember when I took a logic class, uh, the professor said that we would be focusing on validity in the logic class and that soundness was something for the lawyers to think about. Uh, and so anyway, that is sort of the difference between validity and soundness. And so these, uh, the judgments here are looking at the validity of a, of a, um, of a syllogism. Uh, and so that is where Kant's uh, forms of judgment come from. They come right from the sort of Aristotelian uh, sort of logic that people were steeped in uh, from the time of Aristotle all the way up until uh, the 19th century, and uh, particularly people like uh, Gottlob Frege, who uh, sort of pioneered things like quantificational logic, which were improvements on the Aristotelian forms of logic. But anyway, Kant was still in a time where uh, Aristotle's logic was the dominant form of logic and the logic that everybody was steeped in. Uh, interestingly, uh, the hypothetical and the disjunctive were actually things that uh, that were not focused on that much by Aristotle and were uh, sort of uh, popularized more by the um, the Stoic philosophers. But anyway, I don't want to get too much into the history of logic here, but this is where Kant's forms of judgment came from, and that is exactly where he got his uh, his table of categories of the understanding that they had to sort of complement the forms of judgments. Uh, but anyway, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in another video.